Our second reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through chapter 9, verse 8, found starting on page 844 of your few Bibles. Would you please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel? And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. After three days, rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus alone. May God grant a blessing to our hearing and understanding of the word this morning. This week, Jesus and the disciples depart from Caesarea Philippi in Galilee and begin their journey to Jerusalem. It will be a long and eventful journey, beginning with Jesus' question to his disciples as to who people say that he is, and Peter's flash of insight that he is the Christ. But Jesus is not the Messiah that Peter and the disciples want him to be. He teaches them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected and killed only to rise again in three days. Peter, of course, is sure that Jesus is reading from a different script, and tries to set him straight about this whole Messiah thing. Suffering and dying is not how this adventure is supposed to go, especially not for the Messiah. But Jesus will brook none of his babble and puts Peter in his place with the strongest of terms. Get thee behind me, Satan. Get with the God program and put away your dreams of glory. Then he puts the rest of them straight. Being part of this Messiah thing is not going to be a cakewalk to glorious earthly power and victory. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? Now, are we clear on this, everyone? No, not in the least. Lose your life to save your life? 
gain the world but lose your life. What? So the disciples stumble on following Jesus toward Jerusalem. Somehow Jesus must prepare them to be more than just followers. They must become leaders. A few days later, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up Mount Tabor, and he is transfigured before them. His clothes begin to glow, and Moses and Elijah appear to talk to him. It's a precursor of things to come. The dead returning to life and walking and talking upon the earth. Not to mention that Moses and Elijah are both reputed to have been prophets that were raised bodily straight to heaven, as Jesus will be at the end of his ministry. This is all followed by a reprise of the heavenly voice from Jesus' baptism, telling the day's disciples, this is my beloved son, listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. Change your thinking about this whole Messiah thing and get with the program. The whole mountaintop experience. It's almost always transformative and Jesus needs to transform his followers into leaders. Frederick Buechner in his book, Peculiar Treasures, writes about Moses in the following way. Whenever Hollywood cranks out a movie about Moses, they always give the role to someone who is big and strong, like Charlton Heston with some fake whiskers glued on. The truth is he probably looked more like Tevye, the milkman from Fiddler on the Roof after going 10 rounds with Muhammad Ali. Moses is up there on the mountain with his sore feet and his aching back. And this serves as a good example of the fact that when God puts his finger on people, their troubles have only just begun. Exodus 33 tells us that hunkered down in the cleft of a rock, Moses had been allowed to see the glory of God himself passing by, although all God let him see was the back part. It was something he could hold on to for the rest of his life. Mountaintop experiences in our faith journey become those moments of revelation that give us something that we can hold on to for the rest of our lives. That certainly is the kind of experience that Moses had on Mount Sinai and the kind of experience our Lord had with Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. Any experience in which we recognize the living God can be a transfiguration. It may take place on the, the summit of a mountain or as we kneel in prayer on a wooden floor at sea level. It can happen in the midst of a service of worship when God becomes dramatically real to us and we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Christ is our living Lord and Savior. To the ancient Hebrew mind, there was something mystical about mountaintops. Such places were associated with the dwelling place of God, like the Greeks placing their God at the top of Mount Olympus. The cosmology of the Bible was that, that of ancient times, which saw the earth as a flat plain which was floating on water and protected from more water overhead by the dome-shaped firmament of the sky. Beyond the firmament and water that it was holding back was heaven and the throne of God. With that ancient three-story view of the universe, it was only natural that mountaintops would achieve a mystical significance as being as close to God as one could get on earth. 
for both Moses receiving the Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai and Jesus relieving the, receiving the blessing of God on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, the experience was once that shaped not only their future, but the future of God's people for many years to come. Perhaps this is really where Peter, James, and John started down their road, not only to Jerusalem with Jesus, but also on their own journeys from being mere followers to being apostles. What about us? What are our mountaintop experiences? The experiences that have really changed who we are or who we want to be. Was it maybe the birth of a child or a grandchild or perhaps the giving or receiving of a gift? Maybe it was receiving forgiveness that we feared might not ever come or the still small voice of God telling us that we are God's beloved children. When we stop and think about it, we can see that this was just not the disciples that followed Christ on their journey, but we also struggle with our walk with Jesus on ours. How have we been changed in our life journey with Christ? No doubt the longer we have been journeying with Christ, the, the more we have been changed. And looking back, we may see that transfigurations are the rule rather than the exception. We are all being altered in the appearance of our faces and of our bodies. We are all changing. To live is to be continuously transformed. So who or what are we becoming? If we are truly traveling with Christ, we should be becoming more like him. The more time we spend in his presence, reading his words, studying his life, praying to him, like the disciples of old, we should be changing to become more and more Christ-like. Have we matured enough in our faith to see the light of Christ in those around us? Have our hearts softened enough to take some of the compassion of Christ for the least and the lost of this world? Have we reached the point in our relationship with Christ that he has asked us to feed his sheep? We don't have to have achieved any sort of transcendental perfection to reach this point in our journey with Christ. You may remember that Christ asked Peter to feed his sheep after he had denied him three times. It was part of his redemptive challenge. Can you love my lambs as much as you feared for yourself? This particular mountaintop experience took place on a beach, if you will recall. Was it a slap in the face? Perhaps, but it was also marching orders for the rest of Peter's journey would be harder than the first part. What mountaintop experience have you have? How have you changed in your walk with Christ through the years? You are the only one who knows those answers. But you know that Christ works together through all things for our good. And sometimes that is very hard to see when we are in the moment. But I bet if you look back over your life carefully, you can see how God was working in you in ways that you may not have been able to imagine at the time. 
Last year, about this time, I had given notice of my retirement to Hoffman Estates and was sitting for my ordination interviews. The years of study and work were finally going to pay off as I moved closer to full-time ministry. And then for me, the unthinkable happened. The Board of Ordained Ministry told me, no, not now. It wasn't going to go as I had planned. Why not? I wondered. What had I done wrong? I'd walked away from my job, leaving pension money on the table to devote my life to a closer journey with Christ. To say that it was a gun punch would be something of an understatement. But I knew that I wanted to stay here in Woodfield if I could. It was a request that I had made of the district superintendent. I love being your pastor and I love this church and I wanted to remain here. I later learned from the DS that full-time ministry would have meant my moving elsewhere. And many of you know the turn that my father's health has taken. He's been in the ER five times over the last five months and twice in this last week. If I was a new full-time pastor, I would not have been able to dedicate the amount of time or energy that he now needs. What I wanted for my life's journey was good, but what God was preparing me for was better. I'm grateful now to be able to spend time where it is needed, both here in Winfield and at home with my father. Life is a journey. When Jesus set his face for Jerusalem, he knew what was in store for him and his disciples. We do not have that luxury. And perhaps it's better that we do not know. Sometimes it's easier to be like the disciples, not knowing where the road is taking us until we actually get there. But just like the disciples, we need to have the sure faith that God walks with us every step of the way on our life's journey, even at those times when we are not able to see it. Jesus told his disciples that he would never leave them or forsake them. But for a time, it looked like he had been wrong. For three long days, the disciples were lost and alone, wondering what life had in store for them now that their Lord was gone and seemingly about their future now without him. But Jesus had not left them orphaned. He returned to make them into the leaders that he needed them to be, to spread his good news gospel throughout the whole world. God also walks with us, giving us opportunities to witness to the grace of Christ in our lives every day. Do we respond in faith or in fear? Do we feed Christ's sheep or leave them to wander? It can be as simple as a compassionate touch, or even a simple phone call. The choice is ours. Do we take the time? Thanks be to the God who walks with us faithfully every day of our lives, and to Christ who shows us the way. Amen.